Hi there, everybody. Welcome to our vodcast on Earth's revolution and the reasons for the seasons. In our last vodcast, we discussed the motions of rotation and revolution, and we touched on revolution briefly, but today we're going to concentrate solely on Earth's revolution and how it affects our seasons here on Earth. So why don't we get started? Okay, in the past, when I've always asked my students what they thought caused the seasons, the most popular answer was they thought that during the summertime we were closer to the sun because it was warmer, so it would make sense that we were closer, and during the winter time we were further away, getting less sunlight, and thus being cooler. Well, just to dispel that answer here, here's a diagram of Earth throughout its orbit around the sun and marked with the months in which they are located at. If you take a look, our coldest months of the year, the winter months, December, January, and February, they're all located right here, and they are the actually the closest positions to the sun throughout the year. And as we get further away into the warmer months, you'll notice that our warmer months of June, July, August are going to be the furthest points away from the sun. So it's not that the distance to the sun has anything to do with the change in the seasons that we have here. There are actually two other main reasons why we have seasons, so let's get into details about them. All right, so if we take a look at this diagram, what we're going to see here is this. The reasons for the seasons are listed above. The two main reasons are because of the Earth's revolution or movement around the sun and the tilt of the Earth on its axis. And as a result, they're going to affect what we call angles of insulation. So angles of insulation are essentially the angles at which sunlight hits. Insulation is just a fancy way of saying sunlight because it's actually short for incoming solar radiation. And as we know, solar means sunlight. So as we take a look here, I just want to point out that the Earth is tilted on its axis at 23 and a half degrees. All right, so it doesn't sit straight up and down like most students do think. We're actually off center. And this is going to play a big role. So let's take a look at the Earth's revolution around the sun first. All right, so here's a diagram of the Earth moving around the sun in its orbital path as it revolves around the sun. And let's just pay attention to the North Pole because we're in the Northern Hemisphere, so let's just concentrate on that. As you'll notice, the North Pole at this position is tilted more towards the Sun. And as we move halfway around our revolution, you'll then notice that the North Pole is now tilted away from the Sun. So this is a prime example of how tilt and the revolution of Earth are going to affect our seasons because they are going to affect what we call the angles of insulation. So when we are tilted towards the sun and we get more direct insulation or sunlight, that means we are going to have summertime. So that's how you know when it's summer, when the pole is tilted towards the sun. And during the winter time, we are tilted away from the sunlight, so we are going to get less direct insulation, which gives us the cooler temperatures, making it cold in the winter. If you can identify where summer is, and winter is in these diagrams, then spring and fall are easy to figure out. You just have to find the arrows and follow them. So here's summer, and then as we are moving in the Earth's path, we are going to end up in winter here. So as you go from summer to winter, you're going to have fall. So fall is this season right here, and then as we go from winter to summer, we know it gets warmer, and that's where spring hits. So this is going to be spring. So as long as you can identify summer with the poles tilted towards the sun and winter, the poles tilted away from the sun, it'll be easy for you to identify where fall and spring are. So let's talk about how the tilt and the revolution actually affects the angles of insulation. The angles of insulation is essentially just the angle at which the sunlight hits the earth. So here, if this sun ray hits the earth, it's going to hit it dead on, straight on. So this is going to hit it at a 90 degree angle. And as we move up, that angle is going to decrease. So just to make things easier to see and imagine, as the sun hits 30 degrees north latitude here, the angle is roughly about 45 degrees. As we move further up the Earth, you'll notice that there is actually no angle of insulation here because the sunlight just goes right over the top. The more tilted you are towards the sun, like the South Pole being tilted towards the sun, you are going to have a higher angle of insulation. And the more tilted away from the sun you are, the lower the angle of insulation is going to be. Now let's take a look as to how these angles actually affect the amount of sunlight that you have. 
Okay, so I have these two pictures here. The picture on the right is simulating with a flashlight a strike of solar insulation hitting a target at 90 degrees. So this flashlight is actually directly above our target here, the X in the circle. So this is hitting at 90 degrees. And here's a target that we used in the picture on the left, just to give you a starting reference. And then about 45 degrees away, we have a second target that I shined the light on. So if we take a look at our 90 degree angle picture here. If you notice the concentration of sunlight, it's very small and occupies a very small area. The center beam that's sitting on the X right here is very intense in sunlight, and you'll notice that the halo of light is very small. So you have a lot of solar energy being concentrated in one small area. Well, as a result, you're going to get warmer temperatures because you get more radiation that way. However, if you angle the sunlight like this flashlight is, so instead of going at 90 degrees onto this, we're at about 45 degrees onto that target. If you take a look at the central beams, you'll notice that this beam is much smaller, is less intense than the central beam at 90 degrees. And more so, if you take a look at the halo of the 45 degree angle light compared to the 90 degree angle light, the 45 degree angle light has a much bigger halo, which means it spreads out more light over a greater distance. If there's more light spread out over a greater distance, then there's less light being struck in one particular area. The less solar radiation you have, the cooler the temperatures are going to be. As a result, when a pole is tilted more towards the sun, you're going to get more intense insulation. And as it tilts away from the sun, giving a smaller angle, you're going to get less intense insulation. So you'll get warmer temperatures at a high angle and cooler temperatures at a lower angle. All right, so let's go summarize this into the seasons that we have. All right, just to again summarize, the seasons are caused by two major factors. One, the revolution of the Earth around the Sun, so it changes its position, and then two, the tilt of the Earth towards or away from the Sun. And as a result, we're going to get our four seasons. We have the seasons of summer, fall, spring, and winter. Remember, seasons are basically divisions of the year that are separated by weather patterns and also the number of daylight hours. In the summertime, the polar tilt is always going to be towards the sun. And in the northern hemisphere, our start date is going to be June 21st. So you can always remember that the last day of school is usually on that week. So that's summer vacation. Summer vacation starts in June. Summer starts in June on the 21st in June. And we call this the summer solstice. Now, the summer solstice is significant because that is actually the longest day of the year, clocking in at about 15 hours of sunlight. As we go over to winter, winter is going to be the opposite. Winter has got its polar tilt away from the sun. And as a result, that usually happens in the Earth's revolution in the northern hemisphere on December 21st. And that's called the winter solstice. Now again, the winter is the opposite of summer. While the summer solstice is the longest day of the year, the winter solstice is going to be the opposite, which is the shortest day of the year, which has approximately nine hours of daylight. And the reason why these characteristics are different is because if you take a look at the angles of insulation, you're going to have a higher angle of insulation during the summertime than you will during the winter time. And next we have the fall and the spring. These guys share characteristics. So first of all, they have no tilt towards or away from the sun because the sunlight's going to hit the earth on the side away from the tilt of the poles. Now in the fall, our start date for fall is going to be in September. So remember, school starts in September. It starts in the fall. So our fall start date is going to be September 23rd. And we call this the fall equinox. And we'll talk about what equinox means in a couple of moments. And then in the springtime, we have the spring equinox, which starts in March. Okay, on March 21st. Now, the reason why we have the word equinox is because equinox actually means equal night. Equi means equal, nox means night. As a result, what's going to happen is we're going to have 12 hours of daylight. And because we have 12 hours of daylight, we're going to have 12 hours of nighttime. Because there's 24 hours in a day as we learned, so equal amounts would be 12 each. And at that time, we have kind of like a mid-range of angle of insulation. So let's take a look as to why we have these different daylight hours. 
Here we have a diagram of the Earth at the different positions around the sun throughout the year. So let's start off with summertime. As we said, summertime we're going to have the longest amount of daylight hours at 15. All right, and the reason being is this. Since the Earth is tilted towards the sun, there is more of the northern hemisphere exposed to the sun. Since there's more area for us to rotate through to get from the shadows through the sun and back to the shadows again, it's going to take us a longer time. And as a result, we're going to have longer days. Notice the North Pole actually has 24 hours of sunlight. They never have nighttime during the summertime. Now that may sound cool and that may sound great, but it comes back to them in the winter. If we take a look at the winter time, however, you notice in the winter time, the area that lights up the Northern Hemisphere is much smaller than the area that lights up the Northern Hemisphere in the summertime. So because there's less lit up area for us to rotate through, it's going to take us less time to do it. And as a result, we're going to have shorter daylight hours. And if we take a look at the North Pole again, they had 24 hours of daylight in the summertime. However, since they are tilted away and the North Pole is behind the Terminator, the line of darkness where the sunlight ends and the darkness begins, they never rotate back into the sunlight. So they have 24 hours of nighttime in the North Pole. Now, during the, the spring and autumnal equinox, you're going to have equal hours of daylight. And again, if you take a look, at the spacing, the part of the Earth that's lit up here in terms of how much of the Earth is being lit up in this section is actually equal to that of the part of the Earth that's behind the sunlight in nighttime. So it's going to take the same amount of time for the Earth to rotate through the daylight and then rotate through the night. So that's why we have the different lengths of daylight hours throughout the seasons. Now, just a couple of things that you should know. When we talk about the start dates of the seasons, usually we refer to the Northern Hemisphere because that's where we are. The Southern Hemisphere is always going to be the opposite. The start date of the summer in the Southern Hemisphere is going to be December 21st. And the start date of their winter, June 21st. Then in fall, their fall is going to begin or their fall equinox will begin on March 21st and then their spring will begin on September 23rd and again here's the reason why you'll notice that when we are in summertime we're tilted towards the Sun the southern hemisphere is tilted away from the Sun so on June 21st we're in summer on June 21st they're in winter when we are in winter time on December 21st their pole the South Pole is tilted towards the Sun so they're experiencing summer and then because of the way the poles are tilted, they're going to have opposite autumnal and spring equinoxes. Okay, so let's take a look and just describe and summarize the characteristics of our Earth's positions throughout the, its revolution and what we have during those seasons. Okay, summertime. The start of the summertime is the summer solstice, which begins on June 21st. It's the longest day of the year, and it's because the North Pole is tilted towards the sun. As we move out of summer, we head into fall. Fall begins on September 23rd, and we have 12 hours of daylight and 12 hours of nighttime, which is why it's called the equinox, equal night. And there is no tilt towards or away from the sun. Then we go into winter time, and the winter time begins on December 21st, which is our winter solstice, and that is the shortest day of the year. And it's because that we are tilted away from the sun or the pole is tilted away from the sun. And lastly, we have spring as we head into summer, which again starts on the spring equinox, which is March 21st. And as a result, we have 12 hours of day and night, which again is why it's called equinox, equal night. And there is no tilt towards or away from the sun. So remember, when we talk about it in class, it's always in reference to the Northern Hemisphere. So these dates are in reference to our Northern Hemisphere. Okay, boys and girls, that concludes our vodcast on the reasons for the seasons. I hope you found that helpful, and thank you for tuning in.